introductions here. So um, many of you have uh, met Randy before. He's been in the area for, for a, a very long time. He has a master's degree in both botany and zoology. Uh, he's been uh, in the, uh, the field of uh, natural resources, restoration, and so on for over 30 years. Uh, he's an environmental consultant and uh, an educator. He's a licensed Wisconsin nurseryman and propagator. And uh, all of you, most of you probably know that he's been the owner and operator of Prairie Future Seeds uh, from, from 1987 to the present. So, so very talented and uh, lots of experience. Uh, and so we're gonna let uh, Randy take it away at this point. What's that? Just appeared somewhere. I don't know where it came. All right, go for it, Randy. Thank you. Remember, Randy, you need to unmute yourself if you have been muted. Am I muted? Uh, I don't think it, I can hear you right now, so that you obviously must not be. Okay. <laughs> well, initially, this presentation was put together to let people know what. Uh, uh, wildflower and grass and sedge seed sources are good food for birds. Uh, but what I want you to think about today uh, as we go through the slideshow is think about your yard as a natural system, even though it's not. And think about the food pyramid. Oops. Randy, you're muted. Yep. Yep. Randy. Is that better? Now we can hear you, yes. <laughs> now you can hear me. So nobody heard the beginning. Huh? <laughs> no, I will start over. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So initially, this was a presentation about uh, wildflowers and grasses and sedges that birds use as seed sources. But what I want you to think about today as we go through the slideshow is uh, the uh, think of your yard as a natural system, even though it isn't. And uh, think about the food pyramid and are you meeting the needs of all the levels of the food pyramid in your yard? You're gonna get a, a, a brief tour of my yard and I'm gonna kind of show you uh, some of the unusual wildlife I've attracted over the years by what I've done. Let's see, and that button forward button's not working. So try your mouse and or use the arrows. Still got sound. Yes, we do. So the arrow keys either, there you go. There you go. You have advanced. Well, uh, let's see. Yep. So in an urban setting, these are very common animals that we all see. In fact, I have all of these animals in my yard on and off throughout the season, but that's really not what I'm trying to attract. <laughs> we'll give you some resource material to think about that you might be interested in acquiring this book on birdscaping by Marriott Nowak, a person I've known over the years is a very good uh, reference resource for uh, naturalizing yards and uh, what birds are interested in using. Uh, one of the common things that uh, we're doing nowadays, of course, is trapping gray water. And this is not a new concept. Uh, growing up as a kid in northern Wisconsin, we trapped the gray water off of the barn and the house and often used it for watering the gardens in our yard and other things. And of course, in southeastern Wisconsin, we have mostly clay loam mineral soils. Uh, fortunately, up there at West Bend, you have sandy loam soils, so you're, lucky, you're the lucky ones. But uh, for the clay loam, uh, the habitat symbols for choosing wildflowers, seeds, and grasses is wet mesic and mesic. Uh, those aren't definitive terms, they are a collection of describing things, but with clay loam soils, your wet mesic in spring and fall when we have excessive water runoff and you dry out in the summer to a mesic condition. 
And of course, it's time to go back and grab that old copy of Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring. And even more so than in her time, we have a serious problem with uh, chemicals uh, destroying natural systems or affecting our waters and our soils. Some concept questions about a rain garden. I'm gonna kind of skip through this so that we have a little more time for other things. You can read this faster than I can say it. So, but these are uh, questions that people wanna know who have or wanna put in a rain garden. And here's some information from the DNR on that. Here's a residence in West Bend, a very small yard in an old neighborhood and their basement would flood every time it rained because that downspout you see in the uh, picture over here or is right out next to the basement wall and the water would sleep in the basement. Sometimes they would have six inches of water on their floor. Eventually that wall collapsed and an engineering company came in and fixed the wall again and sealed it. They still had a water problem. Well, we just did a simple thing. We got a, a drain tile plastic tubing, which we connected to the spout. We burrowed underneath the sidewalk and went out to the corner of their lot. Now that's only about 35 feet to the, to the sidewalk on the street in the, the southeast corner. And we made a little, uh, depression to collect, to collect the water and to have it spill out there and they never had a flooded basement again. They did the side yard and the front yard of the house with wildflowers and the picture in the upper left shows you what the planting area looked like by the third year. An atypical landscape for a residential house inside the city. These are some other examples of plantings we've done. This happens to be uh, our house uh, before it was rebuilt. And this little garden here would at times before the West Nile virus hit uh, the bird populations would have as many as a dozen or more hummingbirds in it in the summertime. And some others. Now, over the years, I've been in this uh, house for 46 years. We initially had lawn and uh, my lawn is all but gone. And actually large areas of it nowadays look like this. So we walk over the violets and other plants in the summertime. Uh, for the most part, most of what's in my lawn doesn't need mowing, but we mow it a couple of times. Another person who had a spring in their backyard and couldn't grow lawn, uh, Mercantia showed up from out of the woods and filled in this area. So she has a lawn of Mercantia in her backyard and she used bleach to whiten the edges of the stepping stones that she made as the path to the door. What we tend to do with our lawns, right, is we pick up all the grass clippings and throw them away or take them to the community dump site. In the fall, we rake up the leaves and uh, remove all that material. And then we turn around and buy fertilizer to put on the lawn and in our gardens and for our plants. Uh, one of the things that we did, especially when I was a lot younger, is we composted and we put some of these uh, clippings and leaf material back into the, the lawn area and the gardens rather than throwing it all away. These are six or seven species which make up most of the lawn in our yard these days and we walk over these things like I said all season long. They're very durable. Uh, path rush, strawberry, pretty common, three different kinds of violets and some sedges, we have two or three sedges, sink foil. So here's our food pyramid and here's another book you might uh, be interested in picking up is The Ecology of Gardeners. So what composers have, I, decomposers have I seen in my art over the years, we're gonna show you 
some of the producers and then go through the three trophic levels. So I haven't had all of these fungi in my yard every year or uh, all at once. These are different things that have showed up over the years from lichens and mosses on rocks and on the trees to some other mosses, different kinds of fungi, uh, coral fungus, uh, moral mushrooms, ink caps, and slime molds. So, but all of these are involved in breaking down uh, organic material or even rocks in the case of lichens and mosses. And uh, we have vultures in the gravel pit next to our subdivision that uh, fly around and, and uh, check out the yard periodically. We get crows in our yard regularly. This is the most common fly I see outdoors in spite of the fact that a lot of people think uh, blue bottle and green bottle house flies are very common. This is a flesh fly and it shows up to the slightest accident of something, something dying animal like another insect, a, a frog or a bird. Uh, so it's very, very common. Beetles that uh, recycle uh, carrion. And uh, these moths here, some of these are lichen moths that break down lichens and mosses, and others are litter moths that break down leaf matter, and they're in their caterpillars and that are in the litter in your woodland areas where you don't pick up the litter breaking and recycling. So we have some scavengers and recyclers that are in my yard or visit it periodically. Uh, to include the birds and seed sources, of course, the three most widely used plant groups for bird seed sources include native grasses, native sedges, and uh, the uh, Compositae or Asteraceae family. And so here's the six most common prairie grasses found in Wisconsin prairie remnants. And all of these are available to you on the market. Not only do birds eat a lot of prairie grass seeds, but you have small uh, animals like rodents and that also uh, feed on grasses. Here's some of the more common sedges I've seen in the Milwaukee areas and in yards where the only place there might be trees and shrubs are uh, on abandoned lot lines or in the back, but uh, fox sedge, uh, uh, prairie sedge, uh, path rush again, uh, elocaris or spike brushes, and green stem bull rush. There's about 16 species of sedges and rushes I see all the time in the residential areas in Milwaukee. And we uh, manage about uh, two dozen properties where part of their yard or all their yard is naturalized. We visit it once a month and we groom it for invasive species or remove things that shouldn't be there. Here's just a picture of a res res residence in uh, Brookfield, Wisconsin that we did years ago. Oh, there's that nuthatch, which I've seen in my yard in the past. So here are the Asteraceae. Here's your common genera. And uh, the meadow wildflowers where uh, birds go after the seeds. This time of the year, uh, the finches have already taken all the seeds off of the silphiums and sunflowers and are working on the goldenrods and asters. But major genera, uh, regardless of whether they're wildflowers or horticultural plants, are excellent seed sources for seed-eating birds. So here's some of the native coreopsis. I'll let you uh, read the names. Here are some of our native silphiums. Uh, the cup plant is a multi-purpose plant because not only does it attract uh, uh, birds, seed-eating birds and insect-eating birds, but some small birds like to bathe or drink water from the cup plant where it's clasping leaves, catch and keep the water after a rainstorm. 
uh, also large butterflies, your swallowtails, your fritillaries, uh, and the monarch visit uh, silphiums when they're in bloom uh, to nectar. And here's some of our common sunflower species. I think everybody on their property in Milwaukee, if you have any shrub or woodline that you've abandoned, probably has woodland sunflower in it. Uh, these other sunflowers are part of our prairie meadow systems, naked or western showy. Uh, Helen sunflower uh, finished blooming in the fall late and uh, Annual sunflower shows up as a, as a weed in agricultural fields uh, in central and southeastern Wisconsin when they're not plowing them after they harvested their crops. Usually you see annual sunflowers along their perimeters. These are also, this is also the species that you buy your, your dark seeded and your striped seeded sunflower from the horticultural selections of this plant. So. And goldenrods, we might not like goldenrods because it's a wife's tale that uh, they cause hay fever, but that's not true. Uh, goldenrods, all goldenrods have sticky pollen. And so they are insect pollinated. You really can't uh, uh, get hay fever from uh, goldenrod uh, unless you're going to stick them in your nose and, and snort the, the, the pollen, which is sticky. So, but uh, I don't know anybody who does that. And asters, these are some of the more common asters, of course, in the Milwaukee area. And even on highways in southeastern Wisconsin, we had a beautiful New England aster bloom about a month ago. Now New England asters at uh, seed stage. Uh, these other asters are around, but less conspicuous to us, uh, even when they're in bloom. And the echinaceas and yellow cone flowers. Some of these are found as horticultural varieties, excellent seed sources. And spiders, well, we don't like spiders or most of us don't or uh, dandy long legs, but they keep control over other insects, uh, insect populations that have bursts or large hatches and then we have problems with them. This is an egg case, a golf ball size, that was on the side of our house about seven years ago from our garden spider in the yard who was protecting it. And also you can see this spider has captured some kind of prey. And this is a, a garden jumping spider. We have about nine species in Wisconsin. When I was trying to take a picture of that, I would position myself in front of it and it would crawl around to the back side of the plant. And I'd move over there and position myself and then it would move again and try and hide itself. The, uh, the goldenrod uh, spider, crab spider is a chameleon uh, of spiders. It can change color to a background of anything it's on. Here it's on some uh, yarrow flower and is pinkish and white. And here it's actually on a golden Alexander. Uh, but I've also seen it in brown tones. And uh, I hear uh, affiliated woodpeckers here in southeastern Wisconsin on sites that I visit. I, I, I have a couple of employees who live in uh, Waukesha who have this uh, showing up in their yard where it shows up for us is on our property up in Phillips, Wisconsin. And these are holes that it only took it seconds to make. It's pounding in the base, bases of our evergreens up there. And uh, uh, of course, eventually if they pound enough holes uh, in the trees, they die. But uh, it's, it's our largest uh, Woodpecker in the upper Midwest here being about the size of a, of a small goose. And all of these uh, frogs and salamanders and toads have shown up in my yard over the years. And so this is, uh, again, uh, thinking about what you're doing for each of the different uh, food 
uh, pyramid levels that, that would attract uh, more unusual wildlife to your yard. Uh, this summer, uh, I didn't see any salamanders here this summer, but uh, for the toad and the copes and the eastern tree frog, I saw all three of them again this summer. And of course, I've only seen garter snakes in my yard, although I've seen four or five other types of snakes in southern Wisconsin over the years. But if you look at this picture, do you want to guess what's inside this snake right there? I uh, watched it swallow a mouse before I decided to take pictures of it. Oops. I bumped the computer laptop. Hummingbirds and sphinx moths for uh, flower pollinators. We have over 70 different sphinx moth species in Wisconsin. These are the moths that look like hummingbirds but aren't and get numerous reports or people sending pictures and say, I saw this uh, hummingbird but don't recognize it. If you wanna see a lot of the sphinx moths, the best time of the year to see them is in late May and early June. And they're usually visiting uh, the flowers on your trees and shrubs at night. And uh, even though we have about six day active uh, moths, this uh, white banded sphinx moth and this clear wing hummingbird moth are two of the six common uh, day sphinx moths that exist in Wisconsin. And of course, uh, people are aware now and, and working towards attracting pollinators, all your bees and wasps and ants and soft flies. This is probably the rarest uh, bee in Wisconsin. This is the rusty patch. And I have two clients in Wisconsin who have this on their property. And I guess last year, this was uh, the rusty patch, which is the only federally endangered bee species in the United States was also found at, uh, at River Edge. So it's around if you're watching for it. And I think as more people pay attention and watch for it, they will uh, see that uh, it's in other places that we haven't been aware of in the past. The tricolor bee is my favorite bee. It's very common up north. I, Sell it, seldom see it down here. And then this uh, insect, which, which looks like a, like a bee, is actually a robber fly. And it sits on the plants where bees or wasps might visit and it catches its prey. It's caught a paper wasp there. And uh, sometimes bees use old mouse nests in the ground for uh, building their little pods, their, their clay pods, and uh, laying eggs. And then, of course, uh, our bumblebees uh, have a unique symbiotic relationship with uh, closed gentians. We have uh, about five closed gentian species in Wisconsin, and the bumblebees are the only ones who can open the flowers up and crawl in and pollinate them. So if our bumblebees, of which there are about 17 species in Wisconsin, should disappear, uh, we might reach a point uh, like we have with the downy milkweed where the pollinator is missing and so it never produces uh, seeds. And of course, uh, Lepidoptera, your butterflies and moths, more recently, I'm, I'm into moths, so I, I watch for day active moths. This is a orange collared scape and a celery looper, which is an agricultural pest. And this is a, a mint moth. And then the others are butterflies here. So, and uh, while I was out of this house that I'm in today, and have lived in for the last 46 years. I rented a place up in West Bend and we got a tree here at 65 feet tall. And the first time I saw wood ducks in the tree, I thought I was, I shunned it off. I said, nah, I really didn't see ducks. And three days later, I saw them again. 
Well, there's a, you see there's an eight foot stick at the base of this tree, so I could measure the height of the tree and the duck nest is about 45 feet up in this cavity. And uh, I don't know how many young they had, but there were many, I could hear many chirps. And then one day they were gone, they had to go about a quarter of a mile to get to the nearest water source before the baby ducks could eat. Uh, if the uh, baby ducks won't jump out of the nest, the parents push them out of the nest and they don't know how to fly and they don't get to eat till they make it to the water. So I don't know the outcome of it, but it sounds like an arduous task to me if I was a little baby wood duck. Here's another residence here in Sussex, which we did years ago, which had a beautiful sloping hillside, too steep to walk down. Uh, uh, but uh, it uh, took with wildflowers and grasses and uh, turned out to be a beautiful, very beautiful planting. So legumes, the leguminosae or fabaceae, the bean family is another group of plants which, which provide uh, numerous different kinds of seeds that certain animals and wildlife produce. And your milkweeds are also high producers. We're more probably conscientious about milkweeds now than we've been in the past because of the risk of the monarch butterfly being uh, an endangered species and could become extinct here up in the upper Midwest maybe in the next decade or so. The good news is, is the monarch globally is stable and it has established a couple new locations in the world where it didn't used to exist. It didn't used to exist in Europe and it now does and it didn't used to exist out in uh, uh, Hawaiian Islands and out in, uh, out in the ocean out there with other islands. So it has moved its way to some new locations uh, in the world through selective pressure. And yes, it might disappear here uh, in the future. We have about 17 different milkweed species in Wisconsin. Four or five are very common and marketed to us. Uh, most of the other ones we never see are endangered or have some kind of a risk factor to them. And thistles. Well, we think of thistles as a pest and of course most of the Introduced thistle species present uh, weed, weed problems uh, in agriculture and to our other gardens. Uh, but we have two thistles here that are native that are not colonial in their behavior and are part of our prairies. In our wet prairies, we have a swamp or marsh thistle, uh, Circeum muticum, and in our uplands, we have the prairie field thistle, Circeum bicolor. And th these are general rules of thumb, but you can tell uh, a, a good thistle from a bad thistle. Uh, these native thistles have green uh, leaf tops, but on the underside, they have a silvery white appearance, whereas the invasive non-native thistles are green on top and green underneath. Also, the spines of our two native thistle species are soft and flexible, so if you walk into them, you really don't impale yourself, uh, but with the non-native ones, when you walk into them and impale, get impaled by them, they stick to you and you have to pull, literally pull them out sometimes. So these are generalities, but these are two ways in which you can tell uh, these thistles uh, apart from the non-native ones. And of course, albinism has always been an interest of mine. So a lot of the 240 uh, native wildflower species we propagate. We have albino forms of about 65 of our native metal species. Albinism tends to be recessive in wildflowers most of the time and not dominant. Another example of a property we did. And when there's fall migration, uh, our fruit trees especially along the lakefront. We've had clients along the lakefront over the years in Racine, Kenosha, Milwaukee, and uh, Lake Church, Belgium, Wisconsin. And uh, 
all kinds of wildlife shows up for the rotting fruit on fruit trees in the fall if it doesn't get harvested. You can see with the pictures here, uh, houseflies, both blue and green bottle. Uh, butterflies that are migrating and there are 17 other species of butterflies besides the monarch that migrate or to the southern United States at least, if not further uh, south uh, in the winter. And uh, so these migrating butterflies uh, do uh, uh, take advantage of rotting fruit on fruit trees. Uh, the buckeye and the red admiral uh, migrants, the angling uh, is not. Uh, but uh, anyway, everybody's got a feast here. And the next thing that happens is the birds show up, show up to eat the insects. Uh, except that this view is the spring view uh, when, the, when the birds come north and the flowers are in blue and they're picking the bugs out of the flowers that are in bloom on the fruit trees, pear trees, apple trees, plum trees, uh, uh, person, person's property here on the east side of Milwaukee. And then on the north side of my house, didn't have any trees in my yard uh, 46 years ago when we built the house and the only place there was shade was on the north side of the house. So we started to put woodland plants there in, in hopes in the future that there would be uh, trees uh, shading the area even more. Uh, we had a big cottonwood on uh, uh, the, the northeast side of the house that got blown over in the wind. It's about a four foot diameter, but uh, for years, I use that as a uh, bird feeder in the winter time. It's about 35 feet from the house and I'd scatter seed out in front of it and on top of it. We had some different shrubs that have been in the yard here that are rare or unusual over the years. And here's some of the woodland wildflowers that to this day are still uh, on the north side of the house. Of course, now there are a birch tree and a basswood tree and uh, an oak tree that uh, generate the shade that, that all these plants need. And some other residences that uh, we've done in the Milwaukee area over the years. This is uh, what to do with an old abandoned sandbox that kids used to play in. Um, this is uh, out in uh, Mequon on the east side along the lake. And uh, these two residences, they had mowed perimeter or lawn around the house completely, but they also had all the way around the house on all four sides, uh, prairie meadow. So beyond the house, about 35 feet, the rest of the large yards were turned into wildflower meadows. And some fruit, and nut trees uh, that we have in the yard. The exception would be we don't have any blueberries in this yard. I've never been able to successfully grow them here, but the other things we have been able to grow here. And uh, this is another book I would recommend that you read. I've had the chance to listen to Ptolemy present uh, at uh, numerous conferences and he lists uh, the species that uh, wildlife use and how many different animals or organisms might use a particular uh, plant. So if you take something, one of the questions he raises is if you could only plant two, two species or two genera in your yard, what would you plant? And the answer is, of course, you would plant an oak tree and some kind of a prunus, whether it's a cherry or a plum because the oak tree uh, supports about 600 different forms of wildlife and uh, the plum tree uh, or cherry tree about 400 different species mm -hmm. and he also talks about being good stewards of your land and how to generate a balance between what you want in a yard and how you think a yard should look or your neighbors think a yard should look and what you could have if you want a lot of unusual wildlife to come to your yard. So uh, 
Here's a good question for you. Uh, it's about birds is what do you think uh, birds go after in the wild to uh, have healthy uh, egg laying with good strong shells. And this is what they go after, clams, snails, and slugs. They get the calcium from these uh, little animals. Uh, in the picture here, this was a burned over meadow and I'm just trying to show on the ground that when you burn a prairie meadow in spring or fall, you see hundreds of little shells from dead snails that are in and living there all year round. And then these were two nests that were in my yard last year and uh, actually two, uh, 2019 and some birds that nested in my yard. Note the insect that the wren is bringing back to feed the babies. And I'd like to bring your attention to uh, burdock and I guess another plant that we might stick in here that causes problems with small animals or wildlife is uh, teasel. And these plants, uh, small wildlife get caught on them and then they can't get free. So they starve to death. I don't know the outcome of this hummingbird because this is actually the only picture in the whole slide show that's not mine but I found it on the internet. Uh, this bird died of starvation. This uh, monarch was released and, uh, by me and got away. This bat was released by an employee of mine and got away and this bird starved to death. So we should be aware of burdock because it often shows up uh, in uh, abandoned parts of yards or gardens and uh, causes these problems for our small wildlife. Here are some of the endangered plant species that over the years I've planted in my yard and have done well here and are, are still here even though their population numbers might be small. And uh, after I got tired of photographing moths for our butterflies for 35 or 40 years in 2000 and uh, 13, I decided to start photographing moths. And uh, since 2013, I've identified 750 moth, different moth species that uh, have come to my yard periodically. Uh, each time of the year, different moths show up at different times of the year. And the interesting thing is if you're baiting for moths, baiting with black lights and white lights and then putting out things that attract different kinds of moths. Some moths are attracted to nectar, some moths are attracted to carrion like uh, rotting meat and some moths are attracted to rotting fungi or spoiling fruit. Uh, these are some of the most unusual and rarest moths I've seen in my yard. All these moths either are listed as endangered or threatened in Wisconsin. And this is a typical, typical bait station uh, on my house at night. I usually put out a black light and a white light against a, a sheet. And then if I have any bait, I might have it uh, on the edge of the board here or down on the ground below this. Uh, but these are probably the two rarest of the rare that have shown up in my yard. And uh, this moth, the curved halter top, also showed up at a moth out that we did at River Edge Nature Center in uh, 2018, I, I believe. And this is one of the problems we have. This is my neighbor up north. He probably doesn't know that I use this picture in, uh, in my presentation, but uh, he gets part of what conservation is all about. He likes to hunt and he likes to fish. So for fishing, he does catch and release, uh, you know, 95% of the time. We're on a class A musky fishing lake and he always insists even with the uh, bass and northerns, uh, you know, the big ones you put back. 
But on the other hand, he's got a uh, gray water system that he dumps into the lake and he's got a septic system which he lets run out into the lake. And uh, the, our property up north in Phillips, Wisconsin was one of a tract of 11 properties. My property is about an acre and a half and I have about 400 feet of water frontage. So mine's a real short property, but long along the shoreline. All these properties have conservancy land for the first 35 feet on the lakefront. Well, he being a landowner thought that no one had the right to tell him what he could or couldn't do with the trees and shrubs uh, in the conservancy area. So he's cleared his right down to the shoreline and has a sodded lawn. Of course, that's exactly what the DNR doesn't want these days and age with uh, erosion from water wave action from boats and other vehicles that are out on, on the water and then uh, the fact that it undercuts and the shoreline breaks away when there's nothing there to hold it. So unresolved issues and how can we coexist with nature and find a place for both the plants and animals, especially the most unusual ones and uh, still have a yard that uh, your neighbors are pleased with and that you're happy with. So here is our top tier of predators in my yard, including myself. We have, uh, aside from red tail hawks showing up in the yard, we also have kestrels now and then, and then what we call uh, marsh hawks occasionally come flying through, but don't hang around. And we have uh, great horned owls who for years, probably the same pair have nested up in the woods. And at dawn and at dusk, if you stand in the right place in my yard, you can hear them coming before you see them, but they do the same flight pattern every day, checking the yard for potential food sources. And uh, if you wondered what I looked like when I was 21 years old, uh, I grew up in Northern Wisconsin in Taylor County and we lived in an old uh, lumber baron's house and the attic I had as my own place to be. Uh, I also was one of four children, three sisters. They got the bedrooms downstairs, but I loved it up there. I had bats up there galore in the summertime, usually a dozen or more each season, never bothered me. And uh, the rattlesnake master is the plant that symbolizes our company, Prairie Future Seed Company. And we have some books or publications for sale on subjects if you're interested in them. I think now we can attend to questions and we were pretty good on the time because I didn't elaborate on a lot of stuff. Perfect. All right, so people that want to ask questions in person, feel free to unmute yourself. And I think Randy, you need to unshare your screen and- yeah, gotta, gotta find, uh, you are sharing the screen. So what if I- Stop, stop, stop sharing. sharing should be on the top there toolbar. Go. There you go, there, there we, we go. all are. All right, so um, we do have at least one question in the chat uh, and uh, we'll take a look at that. But in the meantime, if people have uh, anything that they want to um, ask in person, um, please feel free to do that. Uh, Randy's covered a whole lot of different um, subject matter there. I think hey, Scott's Randy, ready to, to share. I, I just have a question on, um, I'm in Mequon, kind of in the Southeast corner of Mequon. Uh, one and a quarter acre yard. If I decide to, you know, rescape some of that into like a natural area, are, do people have problems with like the city saying, no, you can't? We, we had the, those kinds of problems in the past. Uh, they're le happening less and less often. And the Mequon is very open to alternative landscapes. We've never had any problems in Mequon. Okay. So okay. The most recent places we've had problems is in West Bend. <laughs> but right. uh, so as long so as I don't see that as a problem. I have, cl I have clients in Mequon, so. Okay. 
Thank you. Other questions, anyone? Yes, Randy, I also live in Southeastern Mequon and um, deer is a real issue for us. I mean, our deer literally come up on our deck. And yeah. so can you make some recommendations? I mean, I pretty much lived here for a number of years and, um, you know, I know goldenrods work and coreopsis works and, and right. things like that. Can you make some more recommendations of seed that you would have that the deer don't really care for that would work nice in a... In a yeah, what farm? we do with uh, people with, uh, with uh, deer problems, and we have a lot of people in Mequon who've had deer problems and also in River Hills, we... Uh, tell them not to do groupings of plant species that they like, that you use a random planting pattern, a more natural looking pattern. And we also can do what are called mask plantings. And that is putting something that they don't eat, like a, like a mint uh, is a good example next to a plant that they find desirable. But when you start taking asters and putting them together like New England aster or you start taking uh, some, your coneflowers and putting them together or your liatrices that's just inviting them in to to eat them all down so you you don't want to group them you want to leave them scattered so okay. mask planting and, and a scattered more random planting minimizes that impact and usually the grazing is the greatest in a new planting while you're trying to bring it in and that so uh, we, uh, there are ways we can monitor it to, that, to, to minimize that. And if you can get past that initial stage where they really like to graze stuff, uh, we, we're off and running, so. Good advice. So uh, a couple of questions that we have in the chat. Someone um, mentioned, Mary actually mentioned that something's attacking her cup plant flowers and uh, any of them just turned black and never never bloomed. Um, any idea of what that might be? That's worked well. Worked? Wisconsin got uh, hit with aster virus almost seven years ago, and this year was a bumper crop year for for uh, aster virus. And we uh, had a lot of our clients had uh, curly topped uh, asters, sylphiums are in the asteraceae or asters that where the flowers were supposed to be turned up uh, what I call witch brooming. They showed a bunch of vegetative buds instead of a nice showy flower. So these are all signs that aster virus has, has gone through on some people's properties and just hit them uh, this year. And there are other variations or issues and aster virus, even though initially was, was limited to members in the asteraceae, they're finding out now that there are some other uh, plant families and, and groups that are just, uh, that are subject to aster virus infestations. And about the only thing you can do because it's cosmetic, they're not gonna kill the plants. So you take off the tops where the virus has hit and bag them and uh, dispose of them properly. And then uh, the plants usually, where I've seen aster virus in previous years, I usually don't see it two years in a row in the same place. So I'm guessing to those of you who are hit this year or with certain plants, you probably will not see it last year, but don't hold me to that because <laughs> it's a real problem, but it's, cosme it's a cosmetic issue. It isn't gonna destroy your plant. It's just gonna mess it up for you for a season, so. That's a shame. Anybody else live questions? Otherwise, we'll go to some of the other ones in the chat. Oh, I have a question. Um, I live in Manches in Northwest Waukesha County. Um, we pull out a couple of euonymus at our foundation. Our house faces north. I'm trying to find a shrub. I know that <laughs> this is flowers, but I need a recommendation for a shrub I can put in there with a shady area. I, well, if you're if you're on the north side of the house, uh, and uh, the thing is, is my expertise is with native shrubs, uh, but uh, any understory uh, shrub that is typically found in our upland uh, upland woods, which would call uh, include uh, uh, there are viburnums uh, are, are shade tolerant, like the uh, cranberry shrub. Uh, there's a, a leather leatherwood or a leather leaf. Uh, uh, a bladder pod uh, shrub, a serviceberry 
uh, trees uh, or shrubs, which are under stories, even in northern Wisconsin of our woodlands, pagoda dogwoods. So there's there's a variety of, of uh, trees and shrubs which will grow under the shade of trees or the shade in the house. So okay. if uh, you're interested and send me an email, I'd be glad to send you a native tree and shrub list if you want one. Okay, yeah, I've been looking through them and I like like oak leaf hydrangea and, and I like the hemlocks, but I'm not so sure that they'll survive on that north side yeah. of the house. Well, and of course those, uh, I don't have any expertise for those because those are horticultural plants. But, oh. So I can't help you as to know whether they're hardy or okay. not. So. Okay, thank you. I think You're Jan, welcome. you had a question, right? Yes, um, I live in uh, Germantown and, and I have um, a ravine in my backyard. I have about an acre and um, I have all the animals that you have. But one of the the uh, bugaboos I have, I don't I, I don't know if you have an answer to this, it, and I ask everyone, is buckthorn? And I know you cut it down and you treat it with Roundup and stuff like that. But is there any other plant that you could put in there um, that sure. might? Sure, sure. Uh, if it's an open area. Yeah. There are plenty of native shrubs that uh, mm -hmm. grow out in the open, and if it's a shaded area, a treed area, yeah. you, there are also many native uh, shrub choices. So, again, if you were interested in a, in a list, you could uh, send an email, email me that, and mm -hmm. I can send you information I have. Uh, 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 we do consulting. If you wanted me to look at the problem, I'd be glad to come out and look at it. So. Cool, thank you. Other questions? I know Judy, Judy Larson has a question about um, a source for prairie grass seed and perennial flax. Where might she get that from? Well, we are, we are uh, is she talking about native, native grass seed or for yeah. sod grass seed? Native, I would imagine. And, well, we are a source for native grass seed, southeastern Wisconsin genetics. For for perennial flax, we don't re really perennial flax is not a not a native. Uh, oh. Uh, so uh, our our flaxes uh, are are yellow, our native ones, and they're very rare and hard to come by. But uh, we use as a cover crop for uh, seeding uh, annual uh, annual flax, not not perennial. So that it's there initially while we're trying to get the prairie plants and grasses to come in, but it disappears and doesn't come back. So there are there are annual blue flaxes out there, but you got to make sure when you order them from the feed mill that they that they are getting you annual and not making the mistake in selling you perennial flax which is usually what's available at the feed mill, so. Good point, thank you. All right, so we have some other questions. Um, let's see, Diana's been collecting compass plant seeds and wants to know the best way to propagate them. Well, throw them on the ground <laughs> and let them come. <laughs> they, they germinate very easily. They germinate, no problem growing cup plants. <laughs> I got people who want to get rid of cup plants, so. <laughs> <laughs> they can take over, that's for sure. They're pretty slow, yeah. big thugs in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it becomes a colonial species. It even forms patches in my yard, so we just cut them down where we don't want them, so. <laughs> we made them into a cup plant maze one year out here, so it was a lot of fun. Oh, uh, <laughs> I guess if you're looking for something to replace canary reed grass in your wetlands, uh, it, it works. That's true. So. <laughs> better than the reed grass, for sure. Yeah. So Diana it's a said- compass, It's a compass plant. Compass, the compass oh. plant, not, not the cup plant. <laughs> well, but all your silphiums, rosin weed, prairie dock, uh, compass plant. So you could stratify them if you, what, what we did as stratifications is we would take a small seed sample uh, and we'd put it in moist sand uh, not not saturated or, or soaked or wet sand with a little uh, fungicide in there to prevent molding in the refrigerator around Thanksgiving and then take them 
out of the refrigerator around Valentine's Day and then lay them out in a, in a seedling tray in a hot house. Uh, so otherwise, if you just want them to come up outside, you would just scatter them on the ground and lightly rake them in and hope that maybe birds didn't come along and eat those seeds before they germinated. Uh, but I would mark the spot where you put them outside so that you, when they come up, you know what you're, what you're looking for. So, so uh, <laughs> the, the things that we stratify on that uh, are mostly for things that we market then as, as starter plants or plant plugs. So, and then we're bringing them to market uh, in the second or the, th or the third season of perennials usually, so. Thank you. All right. Some other questions we have here too is um, Diana asked, she's, she lives on a hill and uh, that has lots of weeds. How does she proceed in naturalizing that hill and killing off the weeds? Well, it uh, you would obviously have erosion risks. So I guess I would start out with from somebody with a site evaluation consultation and we could look at what the risks were and uh, do an inventory of what's on the hill, what's good, what's bad. And then we could make a, a decision on how you might eliminate uh, the unwanted species from the hilltop without losing any more topsoil. If there's any topsoil there, it might not exist on the hilltop in some cases in Southern Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, so it's it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. There have, have been uh, some sites out in the Kettle Mar South Kettle Moraine that we've worked on and uh, minimized the erosion or stabilized it and then put back the native vegetation, so. Good thought. All right. So Jennifer also has a question here. She said uh, she's got ash trunks in her yard. Um, they're cut into manageable seg segments and she would like to know what she should plant around them. Hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know what is underneath them, just lawn? I think Diana, um, yep, go ahead. <laughs> actually what I do is it's in a naturalized area. I just feel that that's good organic matter. So I kind of place them around, but yeah. I'm just wondering if there's, so it's not in lawn. It's not, in, it's not, you know, no. I'm trying to reduce my lawn also. So I've opened up other areas and yeah. I have a lot of ash. We have, we've had to take down a number of ash and we still have more to go. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to do something useful with them, but wondering if there's particular plants that would really enjoy having, you know, a, a big, you know, a big piece of wood. Well, around. usually decaying wood causes nitrogen deficiency. So, uh, uh, oh. you know, like wood chips and that. So, um, uh, uh, things that are more tolerant of decaying wood would be your woodland uh, species, of course, then you, then you need some shade. Uh, otherwise, if you uh, weren't worried so much about the decaying of stuff because you'd keep it cleaned up and that, you could just put whatever grows out in the sun around it where you wanted it. Okay. Last year, I used a bunch of tree stumps, uh, which I don't have now anymore. Uh, uh, as my bird feeder, I had uh, about uh, a handful of them at different heights and different widths in, in front of my picture windows in my sunroom that I used, and I flattened the tops and used them as a bird feeder. Uh, we had to remove the trees that were uh, over our house, uh, or the insurance company wouldn't insure our house anymore. So uh, we had a lot of lot of wood laying in the yard that we got rid of this summer. So I don't know if that helps you, but I don't, I don't it's just well, it's, that. Yeah, it surprises me a little because what I'm hearing you say is that by putting these um, wood segments around, I'm actually deep, deep depleting nitrogen. Is that? No, you're, no, you're not depleting it. They, do, they just cause nitrogen deficiency at the surface, uh, but uh, they're not going to, they're not going to take it out of the ground. So. It's just the process of decaying. So if you were to take a, a go to where there's a wood chip path or something and measure the amount of nitrogen there, it's, it's, it's low at the time of decay. So why? I, I'm, not, I'm not a chemist, so I can't okay, tell you. No, but, I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> but I know that that happens. And, and of course, woodland species are used to decaying wood chips and leaves. 
yeah. on, the, on the surface. So they they will to tolerate that, uh, okay. that type of behavior. So thank you. So Sue would like to know, um, she's got Japanese beetles. Anybody else having that problem this year and what to do about them? It's too bad you can't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> they are good for the birds. <laughs> yeah, I got some beetles too, if you want them. <laughs> I think they're all over. Yeah, they sure are everywhere. <laughs> Not much you can do. Well, and we'll have a a good frost coming here, and that should take care of them for the year. So we don't have to worry about them until next year. Yeah. 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 I've seen them defoliate. Uh, trees in some people's yards, uh, and I've seen them also defoliate certain prairie flower species. It doesn't seem, they don't seem to go after the same species all the time, but when they decide that this is the plant that they're going to defoliate, they do, a, they do a great job, so. But those trees usually recover the next year, correct? Uh, as far as I know, they have. Uh, I get people calling, complaining about it. Uh, probably one one uh, person this summer was having a basswood defoliated by the Japanese beetles. So we we were seeing them this summer in our wildflower plantings on uh, primrose and and gaura, uh, two plants that they were definitely going after out there in the in the prairie planting. So. Yep, I know they do seem to have a, a diet for one thing and the next year maybe something else. So that is a good thing. It lets some of those plants recover before they come back again. So Diana says she's got a pollinator garden and it has lots of common milkweed in it. Many of the plants seemed stunted this year and the leaves were small and puckered. Uh, is there a disease out there? Well, I'm not familiar with anything in particular that's going after milkweed, but milkweed in patches tends to be uh, shorter than milkweed that's, uh, that's isolated. Um, milkweed is also early, an early succession species. So the common milkweed, you usually lose those plants in three to five years. And then if they recede, you might still have, have the patch, uh, but it might have moved for, based on where the seed falls or gets, gets moved to, but you should not expect that those same plants will be there three to five years from now. Uh, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but as an early succession species, it eventually drops out as other more permanent perennial things, good or bad, take over, so. So I, I do know that. Common milk okay, indicator species for um, pollution. So, um, in fact, they're doing studies on that. So, um, if you happen to, that milkweed is coming up near the road, or you, you know, you've had a lot of construction in the area, or something on that order, uh, it may be suffering from actually air pollution. So, a lot of that information out on the internet. So, if you you want to know more about it, um, milkweed as a as a an indicator of pollution, take a look at, at the research that's out there on the internet. That's a good Very good. Any last questions? We're going to wrap up here in just a minute. We'll take one more question. I see a hand up, I think. Somebody? Well, I want to thank everybody for listening today and uh, hope People. that uh, Maybe you find a place in your yards if you haven't already to have some native vegetation and attract some native wildlife. So before you sign off, Randy, maybe you want to share your email address with folks. I think it's fairly easy for them to remember. Sure. In little letters, it's P-F-S-C-O, that stands for Prairie Future Seed Company, at wi.rr.com. Okay, hey, want to repeat that one more time? P F S C O at wi.rr.com. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yes, well, we want to thank, thank you, you as well, Randy. It was wonderful to have you on board. Uh, as you can see, there was a lot of interest in this topic, and uh, we hope to have you come back. I know you have a lot of other specialties that you can speak on, including moths and orchids and, and whatever. So as we go into the spring, uh, perhaps you'll join us again uh, for another key in topics. 
Sounds good. I do want to remind people also <laughs> that the next tea and topic is November 24th, and we'll be talking about turkeys just in time for Thanksgiving. So please do join us again for the next tea and topic on the 24th of this month. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Good seeing all of you. Bye. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.